that you were a black man. I was, you know, going in the store and it said, you know, you don't really expect people to look at you a certain way. You know, growing up, you know, you think everybody's the same. But going in the store, I had people hold me, look at me a certain way, make sure I'm not stealing anything. I actually had somebody ask me, you know, empty out my pocket before because they thought I stole something. And then that point, as I'm looking home, I'm wondering, like, what, what, what about me made you feel uncomfortable to ask that question? And then when I got home, I had this discussion with my mom. She was like, you're black, you're, you're a young black man. It's a thing you got to expect. It's a, it's a sad thing, but, you know, it is what it is in the world. So how, how old were you again when you were in the store in that situation? I would say about 12, 11. I was walking in the store, trying to get a piece of candy, bag of chips, you know, just call about my dad after that. But, you know, as me being black, somebody felt some type of way about that. Thought, you know, stealing, taking the merchandise from the store. But really, this here, I actually had the money at that time. You know, just go in there and get a bag of chips, and then, you know, feel comfortable. I remember for me, I was eight. Um, again, similar to you, uh, one of my best friends growing up was white. And my neighbor, I was like eight or nine years old. And we used to, like, literally go, go outside and play every day. And his dad was a cop. And but he lived with his grandparents, so his dad would like be there like once or twice a week. And I remember like one day his dad saw us outside playing, and the next day he, his grandfather brought him over to my house to come and tell me that he couldn't play with me anymore. Yeah. Wow. What did you think of that? It was hard to register as an eight or nine year old. I didn't I didn't really think of it about race until my parents sat me down and explained it to me. I remember my parents being really mad, and then I started to like have a little bit more understanding. Growing up here in Charlotte, I thought about um, in elementary school back in maybe 67, 68, um, they started a Queen City Boys Choir and it was made up of black and white uh, kids in elementary and I, I auditioned and became a part. And I noticed that when we would go out and perform, we would be together on stage, but at each rehearsal, there will always be the black guys on this side, white guys on this side. And so that was probably my first time really being aware of that type of separation. It became confusing as to why we could be on stage together, but we practiced and socialized separately um, the other times. So what did you think about that? Did you process that at all when it happened? Uh, yeah, I, I, I observed it, but it was not until I got into the seventh grade when busing started here in Charlotte that I really saw the ugliness uh, of what was happening between races as we started having forced busing here. And uh, so from that point, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth, all the way up to 10th grade, there was struggle uh, in the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools between whites and blacks. And so it, it was a challenging season for me. Bishop John McCullough is now the spiritual leader at Friendship Christian Center in Gastonia. It is his full-time job and calling. But he said long before he accepted that call to lead, he was a student who saw riots regularly at West Charlotte High School. These men said they've always felt the need to prove themselves harmless, even when they've done nothing to suggest otherwise. I think it uh, puts us as black men to have to always be at a place of, I guess, defense. Maybe um, always having to be the one to sort of... Um, back down, look innocent. Uh, if you come upon people of another race, you know, you, you have to have sort, a sort of a certain kind of face, not to look threatening, you know, and all these different things, you know, to, that you have to kind of pull off seemingly in order to be accepted just in a moment with somebody coming by or going in a store. You know, uh, I've come through that all these years of, um, you know, being followed and watched. And so you try to figure out how is it I can look as innocent as possible, which shouldn't have to be our burden. It shouldn't have to be an effort like that. But and I'm sure for younger guys, it's even worse um, at this point now. Well, it's an and, right? You know, I, I talk to a lot of young African-Americans now. It's an and. Everything that is going on in your life, whether you are uh, black or white or Asian or Indian for an African-American, it's an and you're black. If it's been a tough day, it's been a tough day and you carry that burden of being African-American, which means all the things that the bishop said, how you carry yourself. How you, you have to always be thinking what someone else may be thinking about me. In addition to all the, the things I have to accomplish in my day. And I think that's where it stays now in America, where it's starting to people are starting to understand that burden a little bit better. They're starting to understand and want to get inquisitive about what it really means, but it's very hard to, to explain it. You have to experience it.
it's one of those things where it's like, if I feel like I can't ever truly be myself because if I'm in a white space or just a non-black space, there's a certain, like you said, there's a certain face you got to put on, right? You know, uh, what's my, both my sisters used to work in, um, and uh, like call services and then you know we talk about you know you have you have your you have your white voice <laughs> when you talk you got your white voice when you talk and it always becomes a second nature thing his you know, white voice these men say they and other black I'm, men I'm, use I'm, a white I'm, voice to count stereotypes that may be triggered when some people see over signs of blackness it's it's a systematic and learned behavior that they have like preconceived thought to know to think like that to think of us as a threat to think of us as you know, illiterate, to think of us as uneducated, to think of us as violent, to think of us as hood rats, to think of being in the hood or being from the hood as a negative. Behaviors like white voice is called code switching, changing your speech, your actions to blend in, to be more accepted in a specific situation. For some people in the black community, it usually means going out of the way to seem less black. Kyle says he's been doing it since he was six years old. How do I prepare myself for the next thing? Like, how do I talk in this situation? Um, how do I communicate this? You know, how do I like either cut back on like the slang that I use and stuff so people won't look at me differently, even though it's not wrong. I can relate to that. In my organization, my company, I'm, you know, the only black uh, vice president. Uh, I work with 80% white people all the time. And in my office, when I'm on the phone, you know, I'll have some of my colleagues come in and say, you talk to one of your cousins. I'm like, why are you saying this? Because you talk to me totally different. My white, my white colleagues will say, I speak to them totally different. And if one of my homeboys calls and I get on the phone, it's automatic. It's, it goes, oh, man, what's, man, what you doing tonight? As opposed to, hey, I'll get with you later, Charlie. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's back and forth. Rashawn says making adjustments to accommodate someone else's fears feels like trying to exist in two different worlds. We never have that opportunity to chill. You can never be off your square. Because, it, because if not, um, either if you get lax and you're, you're in a, a, a mixed crowd, you could be considered threaten, threatening. And then that could lead to something. But then if you're in a crowd of your own people and you're not on your own square, you can be considered a target too. So you always have to be on alert. Being on alert all the time can drive you to the 